This is going to be a really simple explanation of traditional underpainting technique as used by Rembrandt or Rubens or Van Dyck and many other painters besides. I'll give three examples and this is the first. I'm going to quickly try to paint an eye for you and that's how it begins with a very very rough approximation of the basic shape. Then I come back in with a smaller brush which is clean and slightly damp with a thinning agent. I'm using white spirit to cut through the oil paint and I can refine that bigger form. And I repeat this process until I get the level of detail that I want to be able to approach my final layers of colour painting with real confidence. And that is underpainting. By applying paint thickly and then thinning it out, I can achieve various levels of tone. And by refining my bigger forms with a smaller brush, I can solve the problems of shape. Now I'm really gonna put my neck on the line and show you this painting, which I made about five years ago, I suppose it's my attempt to show my allegiance to painters like Vermeer, although I wasn't aware at this point of the work being done by Tim Jennison, and I'd only roughly considered the idea that Vermeer may have been using some sort of optical painting aid. Nevertheless, in order for my painting to remind people of that sort of picture, I needed to concentrate on two things. Firstly, the composition. I wanted to create a sort of cocoon of light between that folded up screen of the laptop and the young woman's face. Uh, so I wanted to keep composition simple but circular so uh, that your eye would travel from the young woman's face down through her body across the hands and imagine what might be on that laptop screen. So that's composition. And I knew that none of that would work if the lighting wasn't just right. I would have missed a chance to create a painting with real meaning. So whether or not it succeeded in that is not really for me to judge, but that was my intention anyway. And so often uh, grand intentions with paintings come down to pure technique. So I knew I wanted to use an underpainting. I wanted to sort all of those problems out by beginning with a purely tonal version of my finished painting made in a single colour. I usually use burnt umber. So yes, I wanted to sort out the problems of tone, light and dark, and the problems of composition before beginning my final colour layer. I mean, I could relax into my colour painting, perhaps even relax enough to show some genuine technical flair. But more fundamentally than all of that, I knew that an underpainting is what I needed to reassure me about whether or not some of the big ideas I'd had for this painting were actually ideas that were going to work. So this is where we begin. This is the same object as I've just shown you. The image on the far left there is probably about 10-15 minutes uh, into my underpainting stages and I'm using a thin down burnt umber as you can see. Here in the second frame you can see that I'm using a slightly less dilute version of my burnt umber and just beginning to push in some of the critical shadows defining that edge of the face and some of the negative space behind the face. And then in the next frame I'm beginning to think about how to bring that head forward and putting in a rough version of the dark tone on that back wall that the girl's head is leaning against, which begins to make the head look as if it sits within three-dimensional space. And you'll see, as we go on through these frames, the more of the large areas of tone I block in, uh, the more it starts to take on uh, three-dimensional tonal quality. Here, I'm still uh, just adjusting some of the smaller shapes and trying to be quite objective really about deciding which areas of the painting would be most important to the way that it functioned and which areas of detail I would need to put in in my underpainting to really reassure myself in the, in the last stages of painting. So that hand hanging over the laptop keyboard I thought would be relatively inconsequential, worth paying attention to but certainly not as important as the expression of the girl's face which I thought at this point would actually be the expression of the picture. For that reason I took real care. I used a three millimeter filbert brush placing my tones in carefully, refining the shapes by removing paint until I got what I wanted. In this next frame then you can see that I'm starting to block in the big areas of tone and as I do that, I'm starting to be reassured that the dark areas really do push the lighter forms forward in the composition. And generally it's becoming a whole picture rather than just assembling a sort of painted skeleton. 
I really want to reassure you at this point that I was getting things wrong. I was putting things in the wrong places, taking things out, putting things in, tweaking things all the time and not taking anything too personally because I knew that everything could be adjusted because the oil paint stays wet. I think one of the reasons that underpaintings seem like such a useful safety net and why I always seem to learn so much from them is that this is never going to be seen by anyone else. It's not about impressing anyone. It's about sorting the painting out for yourself. How much detail do I need? As an example, do you remember what I said about that hand not needing to be much more detailed than it is there in the underpainting and that the face needed much more work because it was really the linchpin of the painting? Well, in actual fact, it turned out that that hand was as important to the overall expression of the painting as the girl's face. And perhaps I should have taken more time to take stock of the underpainting I'd made before moving on to my final colour layer. Anyway, in the end, I ended up sorting all of that out in the final stages of colour painting, which was a little bit awkward, but you live and learn, I suppose. In any case, the picture on the far right, I thought I was happy enough. There was enough detail about the general movement of the forms throughout the picture surface and enough detail to let me go on to colour painting confidently. In a minute then, I'm going to make an underpainting from scratch and you can see all the processes in real time. But to begin with, let's run through the equipment we'll need. That's white spirit in a bottle. I'll be using uh, that to clean the brushes and to dilute the paint. A bit of towel there to wipe my brushes clean on. A palette, just a piece of old plywood, and burnt umber is the only paint I'll be using here. Now onto the brushes. My biggest is my uh, quarter inch round synthetic sable brush, similar in size to the hog's hair brush I've used in previous videos for blocking the big areas of tone in, but because it's a soft bristle it makes a slightly different mark. You might want to be aware of that. As a middle brush, I've got a flat quarter inch hog's hair, which is quite stiff, so that will be just about right, I think, for removing paint to refine the larger areas of tone that I put in with the big brush. And then finally, for refining even further, a three millimeter filbert, synthetic uh, nylon uh, filbert brush. Uh, and you'll see I'll be applying and removing paint with that to achieve uh, the level of detail that I want. As for the painting surface, I've got a sheet of 150 gram cartridge paper primed with PVA glue. You could use a piece of canvas or board, but that priming is what's going to allow us to push and pull and remove paint on the surface of the picture and refine our larger forms. Before I begin the final painting in this tutorial then, I want to take a moment to thank Tim Jennison for four fantastic years of help and support as I've been researching his comparator mirror as a teaching aid. In my emails with Tim last week, he told me that he's still really excited about what I'm doing with the comparator mirror. He also mentioned that, so far on the channel, I've neglected to mention the importance of lighting when using the device. And he's exactly right. So I think I should take a moment to do that properly now. Lighting is critically important to any painter uh, making work from observation. And in this studio, I have a big skylight above my head here, which throws down really good, consistent daylight uh, all through the day, uh, no matter where the sun is in the sky or what sort of weather conditions are going on outside. For comparative mirror painting, that's a bit problematic. Light from above means that my source image here on the source plane is always in shadow. And my painting plane here, onto which I'm going to be applying my paint, is always comparatively well lit. This means that any uh, tones or colours that I observe here will always be slightly off the tones and colours that I paint here. Everything will seem to be making sense until I take my finished painting off and compare it, and it's at that point I'll see that my tones and colours are mismatched. So, for the total outlay of about £10. You can buy yourself an angle poise lamp. This is nothing fancy at all. Just a normal warm light light bulb in it. It doesn't have to be a tungsten or a daylight bulb, but it could be if you want to make things a bit easier still. And you can see instantly that it does what I want it to do. It evenly lights both planes of my comparator mirror. And now I'm guaranteed of getting uh, accurate color and tone matches um, from here to here. 
Right, with that properly taken care of, I'm going to start getting on with my underpainting. So I'm diluting a bit of the burnt umber there just to make it uh, easier to push and pull around on the surface of the picture. As I've said in previous videos, I'm looking down to the mirror to compare my source image there of a Velasquez portrait uh, to the surface on which I'm painting. I will explain all of this in due course, so if you don't know what a comparator is, just bear with me. The more important thing to pay attention to is that I'm using the biggest of my brushes to block in the big shapes. I'm really not interested in detail at this point and I'm noticing what the paint is doing. As I start to use this, uh, the paint that I loaded onto the brush at the beginning of the image, it's starting to wear thin, so I'm starting to achieve a sort of mid-tone there. And this shot gives you a good idea of how the comparator mirror works. I'm checking my source material in the mirror, and then I'm making a mark, and I'm comparing back and forth all the time, and continuing to build the image up that way. You will notice that my source image in this setup is shifting around in the mirror very slightly. That's because it's off by perhaps half a degree. It needs to be really finely set up. And now, this is all still a big experiment, and I'm still trying to find ways to prove myself wrong, but so far my research does seem to suggest consistently that the comparator mirror can be used as a way to introduce people to these sorts of painting techniques, particularly people with very low confidence. And I think the real beauty about the comparator mirror in a teaching context is that students aren't tracing anything. They're still painting by comparison, except that the distance of comparison has been reduced from a few feet in the conventional sense to a few millimetres. So to remind you of how this fits in with the demonstrations I did earlier, so far I've been using a sort of mid-tone to block out all the basic forms, and now I'm using a slightly darker tone to just, just place forms within those larger forms, which begin to describe an eye within the shadow of an eye socket, for instance. And as I begin to block out the rest of my painting, it will begin to take on a sense of three-dimensional depth as all of those tones balance out, despite the fact that there is no detail in this painting as of yet. In fact, you know what? Let's take a look at the original uh, Velasquez that I'm copying. The details of that marquetry on the back of the chair are really full of dynamism and confidence, but not a lot of detail. It just goes to show that you don't need to cram the whole picture surface with tight brushwork in order for it to be really dynamic and resonant. And when I've talked earlier in this video about being relaxed in your final layers of painting, that's the sort of relaxation I mean. Here you can see the beginning of the refinement of these shapes now that I've blocked them in. I'm still using the big brush, but I've dipped it in the white spirit, I've wiped it clean, and now I'm sort of tidying up, I'm sweeping up if you like, as you would do with a kitchen floor. Another good tip here might be to remember that you shouldn't try to achieve all the detail you want in one pass, one uh, placement of the general forms and then one refinement. I find it to be a general tightening up process in which I'll work for a few minutes on one area and then move on to the next. Now that I've got the eyes, nose and mouth in roughly the right shape, I'm going to start to think about some of the areas of the face which are equally important. The way that a forehead folds or the way that a cheek seems to hold weight and uh, the muscles underneath the cheek or around a jawline are just as important to a likeness as eyes, nose, mouth. That might seem to be contradictory given what I just said about not packing detail into every inch of a painting necessarily. What I mean to suggest is that whilst not every inch of the painting needs to be covered in tight brushwork, every part of the painting does need to be considered. Now I'm, more quickly than I thought I would, using the 3mm filbert, again dipped in the white spirit and wiped clean, to refine those big broad shapes around the eyes, making those comparisons with the comparator mirror all the time. And I hope you can see that it doesn't really take more than four or five slow, careful removals of paint before those inanimate daubs of burnt umber really start to resemble a man looking out at you with intent. So with that in place, I'm going to borrow some paint. I'm going to go back into that very roughly painted nose and use the same technique of applying more paint fairly roughly before removing it to refine the shapes. And I may or may not end up with exactly what I want first time, 
but there's nothing to stop me, whatever the outcome, from wiping everything clean and beginning again purely for the sake of practice. We think of actors rehearsing and re-rehearsing a script to really master a performance. It's funny that we don't allow painters the same flexibility to get things wrong or to experiment. Here's another example. I'm looking at that eye and seeing that it's not really looking back at me in the way that I want it to. So I placed in a large, fairly non-specific form with the medium-sized brush, and there I'm refining it with my 3mm filbert brush, just as I did for the nose, just as I did for all the other elements. And then just a touch of shadow underneath his eye. And that's what I wanted. Now he's beginning to look at me. And I'm starting to feel that there is enough information in my uh, underpainting to be able to relax about the whole business of putting this painting together. Here I'm just drawing in actually some of the shapes that I see in the shadow on the side of the face and then blurring them with my largest brush wiped absolutely clean and dry. Drawing forms in like that and then blurring them with a bigger brush is just another way of getting the big forms uh, in quickly so that you can see how they all work together. Ordinarily then, I would say that this was a finished underpainting. It's got all the information I need there for me to feel less stressed out about the whole process from this point. But for the sake of this video and to put my money where my mouth is, I'm going to rub out that eye. I'm going to see if I can paint it again for the sake of practice and to reassure myself that it wasn't a fluke the first time. Why don't you try the same thing? I grant you it will take a leap of faith to begin with, but if you can get into the habit of making and remaking certain areas of your pictures, underpainting will start to seem like a rehearsal. And just as with actors, you'll begin to trust your own abilities more, and that will lead to a far more commanding final picture. So, good luck, and see you next time.